I might. Well, welcome back. I hope everyone had a nice dinner and uh, is ready to go for some discussion of radio uh, drama, audio drama for this evening. And uh, I'm Jeff Billard, and I'll be your moderator for this. And uh, this is about teamwork in the writing process. So uh, quickly about me, this is probably the third time you've seen me if you've been around all day. So I don't want to make it too long except to say that uh, I'm a uh, retired theater professor who taught primarily acting and directing and uh, script analysis courses for many, many years, directed lots of plays and started doing audio drama back in the early 80s with students. And uh, then I heard the um, NPR Star Wars audio drama, radio drama in like 81. And uh, I thought, still think that's one of the best things that's ever been done. And uh, then met Bill Holweg in mid 2000s and kept on going with uh, radio drama to today. So I'm excited to uh, be here and be the moderator for this panel. And I wanna welcome in the guests and ask them to give us a little introduction for themselves. And I'm gonna start out with, and I'm gonna say this right, Ellie Maitland. Ellie, there you go. Just there tell us go. a little about yourself. Uh, yeah, I, um, I am a, an artist working in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, my focus is in Foley design and choreography and performance for live audio drama on stage, but I've also done Foley for films and for pre-recorded uh, audio dramas. I also uh, do occasional voice acting. I might be recognize recognizable as uh, uh, Switchblades Cobalt from Our Fair City by Heartlife NFP and also The Waitress in their most recent production, Unwell. Um, and let's see, I have performed or designed and or designed fully for over 80 productions in the Chicagoland area. And I've consulted for theater companies uh, internationally. And I've lectured at a couple of colleges on stage fully. And uh, I like playing with noise toys. And it's great to be here <laughs> about collaboration and the artistic process. I love it. I have to tell you, I've directed a couple of live, uh, you know, audio dramas and, and, you know, the Foley takes, it just steals the show. Absolutely. Everybody just, you, right. you know, and, and, and I think that it was uh, mm -hmm. the creative people who did Foley in those productions and they made everything from scratch out of these contraptions. And I don't know, mm -hmm. you, I would love to hear your process, how you do that, but I'm sure we'll have some time. Because uh, I just, hope that uh, you'll join us tomorrow, uh, Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern yes. time, uh, when I'll be shoehorning in as much as I can into that session. Oh, I love it. I love it. And, and the audience was just like, oh, I couldn't stop watching those guys, you know, doing it. It was, it was fantastic. So thank you. We're glad that you're with us. And I don't know if, if Keith is in yet, so I'll go to my brother, Lothar Tuppen. Hey, Lothar. How's it going? Uh, like I've said before, I've been doing audio drama since 2010, first acting, then writing and producing, and um, worked with a lot of different people from Broken Sea to Pennant Productions to my own stuff. And uh, I only write by myself. I'm not going to talk to any of you people. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I can't tell you how much I love Lothar. So. <laughs> and I'm the class clown. Yeah. Yes, he is. We have to watch him. So, Ellie, keep your eye on him. Yep. Done. Keith, are you are you with us? I certainly am, and I, I keep right. my I keep seem to appear and then disappear again. I'm not sure why yeah. that is. Um, hey Jeff, if you ask me to keep an eye on Keith, that might be harder. Yeah, <laughs> that's going to be a lot harder to. Uh, yeah, Jack just know. said it's because it's audio drama. You're just yeah. like you're really getting into character. <laughs> so very you're sorry. The voice, you're that. the voice in the dark. It's the shadow of Keith yeah. Morrison. <laughs> Yeah, then and there's not much to see here, though. Um, <laughs> my name's okay, Keith. Well, how about if you tell us a little about yourself, Keith? Absolutely. Uh, I've Thank been you. I've been acting at various, uh, you know, uh, professional, semi-professional community levels for 30 years now. Um, in uh, I've always been a fan of old time radio. Uh, always been a, a huge fan of old time Hollywood and old time stories and classic stories. Um, in 2013, I started doing live. Um, <laughs> I like that comment. Uh, um, 
I started doing it live in uh, 2013. So we, we tour museums and, and do some, some smaller shows. This was a time when I would say, let's do an audio drama or a radio show. And people would say, what's that? And I'd say, well, it's a, uh, it's a play with just audio. And they'd say, oh, uh, a staged reading, you mean? I said, no, no, it's quite different. Um, and then last year during uh, COVID, uh, unfortunately, we couldn't perform anymore. I'm the executive director or the show pope, as I've been informally, informally called, of Lions Den Audio the or Lions Den Theater. And we branched out and started doing Lions Den Audio uh, through YouTube. Um, the tech side, brand new, very new at that whole thing. But, uh, you know, it was actors uh, working in a new discipline. Certainly, Jack has been a, a major mentor over the years. So this is a lot of fun. And uh, I thoroughly, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here tonight. Awesome. Keith, what city and state are you performing out of? We're in Halifax, Nova Scotia, actually. Oh, okay, cool, uh, not cool. too far from Jack, yeah. Cool. And it looks like Jeff disappeared into the ether. Oh, we bored him already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he doesn't even have audio, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, hopefully he'll be back momentarily. No matter how hard you perform technology or, or prepare, technology can always be a... Yeah. a Doozy. We've been we've been doing pretty well today, so um, oh, you know, I guess we're due for some glitches. Yeah. It's a miracle of technology, wasting our time at the speed of light. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, um, I mean, he, uh, uh, Jeff had mentioned a few things that we were going to cover. Uh, should we perhaps jump in until he's back with us, or? Sure. Let me. The inmates uh, are running things now. Exactly. Let me yes. Look up the document here. Uh, here we go. So I know that a lot of the like teamwork is, is one of the big things. Do you guys work with large teams or? I have a couple of times. Yeah. Um, they're typically with um, pretty uh, set or delineated um, responsibilities. Like mm -hmm. we have a couple of uh, in the in the main companies that I work with, I have worked predominantly with one horror company and with one comedy company. And just I'm sure you understand, Keith, given the nature and novelty of audio drama for stage, mm -hmm. probably other major theater companies will dip their toes in like once every couple of years, like maybe yeah. if they want to do War of the Worlds or if they want to do a uh, Christmas Carol or uh, It's a Wonderful Life. But yeah. other than that, it's uh, kind of a niche discipline. You just um, need, you just named the big the three. Vacancy entertainment, which is, huh? You just named the big three that everyone likes to dip I in did. and do. <laughs> yep. My pet theory, because I noticed that like uh, audio drama season is basically from the end of October through Christmas, mm -hmm. is that more often than not, uh, uh, theater companies will introduce themselves through War of the Worlds. And then when that is a really good uh, haul for their company, they'll say, what else we got in this catalog? And then they'll discover all the holiday fair that's still out there Absolutely. as well. So yeah. that's how I think that usually uh, exists. But we, uh, Locked in the Vacancy, did monthly shows uh, live on stage in the before times. Yeah. And we had an acting ensemble and we had a writing ensemble. And I was the resident Foley artist, but I would typically um, have a couple of people that would help me out if I needed an extra sp uh, set of hands or in the event that it was dramaturgically applicable, uh, I might uh, pull a couple of uh, characters, actors as characters to help me with uh, multi-hand effects if I thought that it would help them and like sell the artistic and like narrative unity for the audience to see them in, in these uh, actions as well. Cool. Yeah. Of course, that does depend on them having, you know, a sense of rhythm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Absolutely. Oh, he's back. And we got back. Back. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, I lost my background. Sunspots. Yeah. Well, we've been having big thunderstorms around here. Ah, so I don't know. If, uh, good old Cape Cod Mass, you know, we have the weather changes every storm? five minutes. Uh, good. So thank you. Uh, I'm back. So, um, I don't know what you guys did when I was gone, I'm, I'm, uh, but I, I was I was curious about, and maybe we can start with with you, Ellie. Um, I don't know how much you write, but I'm curious about your writing process. Uh, um, 
Uh, yeah, well, I was relaying that um, one of the main companies that I work with, which is a comedy centric company, like there's a, a small team of dedicated writers, typically, yeah. and an acting ensemble. And I handle, uh, like, I'm the resident Foley artist. Uh, more often than not, I'm working solo, but there are a couple of folks that have also done Foley that I know I can uh -huh. call on if I need an extra set of hands. But also dramaturgically, I might try to pull in uh, an actor that is playing a particular character if I think having them perform a sound that would be of their world is mm -hmm. applicable uh, for the audience to, to observe. Um, I have written for that ensemble as well. And okay. I think that's one of the things like having a set group of uh, actors that you're pulling from on the regular uh, gives you a sense of their voice and how they approach mm -hmm. certain characters. And so that can really help for adding uh, for building a team dynamic like that. They also get more agency uh, over characters as they're progressing in uh, serialized content like this. So they might have more opinions about what sort of adventures or uh, bits their characters might get into, which can be really fun. Well, that sounds great. Uh, thank you. And uh, Lothar, mm -hmm. just a little bit about your writing process, just as a baseline, and then we can go into yeah. the teamwork piece. Yeah, mostly I uh, envision a, a story seed, at least in my head, and um, mm -hmm. get the idea of it almost like remembering a dream and then start working on it from there. Sometimes it's more really go with the intu intuition and just sort of let it happen. Sometimes it's a little more planning out and trying to sort of, so sometimes it's more like playing jazz. Sometimes it's more like doing a classical composition. Um, mm -hmm. And where I think it's interesting is that both of those aspects change when you're working with another person. They can both come into play, but the way you deal with both the planning and the sort of just you know riffing uh, has to work differently when you have another person there. So I think that's very interesting that we'll get into, I'm sure. Yeah, we will definitely get into that. Uh, Keith, how about you? Uh, what's your just writing process on your uh, on your own when you sit down to write something? Um, it's it's get through. Um, that's the number one thing. <laughs> um, complete something, um, mm -hmm. and and that's always number one for me because so many things are half done. Um, so there is there is that. Um, ultimately, you know what I'm looking for. And, and uh, Ellie mentioned it uh, sort of as well, is, is I do have sort of a core, core group, uh, people who are on time, people who have good audio and people who have talent and people who will promote. Um, so it's always what can I do for them rather than what can uh, I, I do and then cast people in. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's that backwards way. It, it, I always say it's the Coen brothers situation. You have your core group and then you pull five or six people in, um, you know, who, who, who will, will do certain things well, um, or who just want to try it. That's the other part as well. Um, so really for me, it's, it's sit down and find something entertaining, maybe a little message in there and, uh, and, and, and just have fun with it and, and create something people are really going to enjoy. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think for me and, and writing for audio drama and adapting audio drama is, is a new process for me, but with everything else that I've worked on that I've written, it's, it's like envision the final project and, and work back from that. Um, that's how I've always that's done it. And it's, that's worked for that's me. That's good. And it's whatever works. And I understand the thing about finishing, uh, we were talking about it earlier and I don't know how many scripts I have that are unfinished, you know, and, and uh, I'm not quite sure how to finish them. Yeah. So, but hopefully, hopefully one of these days I will. Uh, I don't, I don't know. Um, as we go. So as we all talked about our, our own writing process or how we go about it. And, and um, you know, I know in talking about both Ellie and, and Keith, you talked about having that core group. I always think of, our group like Lothar and Jack and Tanya and Joe, you know, Joe Stofko and those people as kind of a repertory company, you know, and then it's like, but we're always trying to bring new people in because it's, you know, we're all kind of in some ways uh, come from the Bill Holweg tree, right. Of, uh, of audio drama. And, and uh, it was always his mantra, you know, bring people in get people in, you know, get people to, and so we're always trying to do that. So I, I think it's important to build a team and I'm glad that uh, I may have even suggested this topic. I don't know. Um, but 
um, just to build a team that you can count on. And of course, Keith, you bring up something about showing up, right? And Ellie, I'm sure you know in, in the world of theater, right? If you're if you're there, if you're not there 15 minutes before your call, you're late, right? And mm -hmm. and uh, that's so important, right? There, uh, there's a much larger conversation going on right now. I don't know how uh, how prominent it is in uh, outside of big cities, but yeah. with Chicago, one of the things that we're recognizing uh, that we're uh, complicit in with the ensemble model. Uh, there's a big habit. One of the big, uh, one of the first companies I joined is uh, was founded by folks I went to college with, mm -hmm. and that makes perfect sense. We all had the same education, we had the same vocabulary, we built on that to have the same passions, and right. moved up here and started a theater company. But that can't be a way of trapping yourself into being complacent and insular. And exactly. when it comes to class issues, that's another one of the things that uh, with Chicago being. Uh, a very industry town, but a big storefront town mm -hmm. uh, where there's not, there's never enough money. But right. that is one of the things that has also kept the Chicago North Side scene predominantly white and privileged, which also robs us of telling more complicated and more valuable stories that help our, us with our humanity. So there is a big pushback right now to find it, uh, to trying to figure out ways to broaden our circles in ways that are more inclusive and equitable. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things that you can do beyond being the person that shows up is make sure that you're showing up for everyone else. Right. Good yeah. point. I agree. And I totally agree with all of that. Just to bring in new people, new voices. And we, we had a nice conversation about appropriation this morning and, and things like that. Yeah. And oh, so good, good, good. To, to do that and just kind of welcome in everyone. And, and tell stories from many different voices and um, you know, encourage other people. And, and I think what you talked about, about I think for many of us, that model that you talked about is you get out of college, right? Study theater or whatever, you get out of college, there's not a ton of jobs around. So what do you do? You start your own theater company, right? And you, <laughs> you do it in a found space or you do it wherever you can do it just so you're working and, and then little by little things happen. And I think, you know, so many people have done that. And I think most of us have done that with audio drama, right? So, you know, well, there's only so many parts where I'm gonna start my own and then, yeah. you know, we'll go from there. I'll tell the stories that I can tell, you know, from my that point of view. Of the, that is one of the insidious things about it. We all recognize after a point. And I think probably it's one of the things that you start noticing after you're older and have had a lot of those opportunities and uh, are suddenly finding yourself looking at ways of making sure that the people below you have those same opportunities is reconciling that very few of us start theater companies because we want to run theater companies. Right, yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. Also, I'm fond of <laughs> saying uh, Chicago theater practitioners are to venues what potheads are to bombs. We'll make them out of anything. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's theaters everywhere. Exactly. You know, I, I mean, you just look at, at Manhattan back in the 80s when people were doing theater and, and bomb, you know, bombed out buildings and burnt out buildings and just kind of occupying spaces. Um, you know, but, but it, it's, it's kind of what I love when you talk about bringing them way off topic, but I think it's an important thing to talk about, um, you know, uh, uh, things like uh, public theater. When they would go around New York City and they would bring down the back of a truck, they would bring theater, they would bring Shakespeare to inner city or, you know, there was one time, I think it was public who they did Romeo and Juliet in this abandoned building and you went to different floors to see different scenes of the show and, and it was all inclusive and it was people of color and it, you know, it, it was this amazing thing. So, so anytime we can bring more people in and especially people whose voices have not been heard, whether it's whether it's people of color or people who are transgender or you know anyone in LGBTQ plus or whatever, people who are autistic. I mean, doesn't matter, you know, to bring those voices in and let those voices be heard. And so I, I think that's that's important. And I think it's part of teamwork. So I don't think we're that far off the beam in, in talking about it and, and to help those of us who have been doing it for a while to try and help others come in and go, yeah, you can do this. That's, you can do this and I can help you, you know? So, um, so it's good. And now, yeah, I want to get to some of Jack's questions so he doesn't yell at me later. Um, 
when you write, um, how do you write with, with a team or do you, or how do you work with a team? We've touched on it, but Lothar, why don't you start us off? Like, how do you, uh, how does that it, work for you in your world? I'm kind of a listener when it comes to it. I don't want to tell somebody else. I'm very easy to work with. I like working yes, with people. And so it's like, okay, you tell me what your constraints are. We can talk about it. But if someone has a way of doing it or they want to do it, I, I will fit into their mold. Uh, so there's been times where I've let them write first and then I respond and I ask them, you know, what it, what are some of the parameters here? What are you looking for? You, it, let me treat you like the showrunner and I mm -hmm. will try and meet that goal as best I can without losing my own voice and my own passion for the project. There's other times where the other person might be really scared and not know how to begin that. So I will take that on in order to help them out. Um, there's times where it's completely equal and that can be a lot of fun, like the stuff that you and I have done with, uh, you know, with our, um, you know, spy thing. Uh, yeah. it, it really depends, but I, I think listening to the other person, knowing how do they want to play the game? What are they, what makes, what's fun for them? What's fun for you? And where does that meet? It, it's almost like, like uh, learning how to have a, a relationship in any, in any way, whether it be a friend or something more intimate, like a romantic relationship, because writing is a lot more intimate than just getting together to have beers. And so right. there's, there's a lot of similarity in the way that you keep a relationship healthy both writing and not and that gets it out of the way of to where you can just focus on the art definitely and and uh, i think that's so true keith how do you write do you write uh, at all with a team at all and if so how does that work for you i i haven't had much luck to be honest writing okay. with well others. let's talk about that i think that's a great point yeah i, I think you know um so often for me, the performers uh, bring so many elements to life during either rehearsals or script reads or discussions. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's where a lot of their stuff has come into play. Um, they've brought things to the table that I never would have thought after I've given what I thought was a finished script. And, uh, and like Lothar, are very open to what people want to contribute and where they want to take it as far as sitting down at a table with others I, i've maybe done it once in in a very very long span um it, it's not that i don't work well with others it's just in that sense i find speed especially when you're doing this as sort of a a side hustle or a volunteer deal right mm -hmm. speed and inspiration are are are, are key um, to getting it down. Um, and unfortunately, inspiration and, and, and availability sometimes hits us all at weird times and in weird fashions. And, and I love my writing time has always been like three in the morning. Um, so to have like meetings at three in the morning, there's very few who can do that and, and will do that. And very few places that will let you sit around at three in the morning. So, um, yeah, it's uh, I, I absolutely love the feedback session um, that comes during the rehearsals. I've workshopped a few things over the years, um, but I sometimes find that with like work, even with workshops, people sometimes feel like they have to say something. This would be better if even if that's not necessarily something they're thinking. Um, and then the other thing, too, I've often found writing with others is even how we approach the craft. I have a dear friend. He's a tremendous writer. However, when I have collaborated or tried to collaborate or we've tried to collaborate together, he's very tied to the things that are in books. Like Stephen King says, don't do this. So I'm not going to do that. And I well, maybe that that works for Stephen King. And there are elements of what he says in his on writing book, like six pages a day. That's brilliant. We should all try for that. However, using adverbs when describing dialogue, well, works well for everyone except Stephen King. So we can't mire ourselves into these hard and fast rules. So, yeah, I'm, I don't write well with others, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, that's good to talk about, though, because I'm sure there's a lot of people who feel that way. Sometimes it's, it, sometimes it gels and sometimes it doesn't. And, um, but I think it's important to say that. You know that yeah there's there's issues sometimes and it, it's but i i you know i applaud the fact that you're 
that you said, you know, when you go in with actors, you bring it in and, and you know, you're open to listening to what they say. And, and just because I think, you know, locking something down and just making it static, you know, without putting choice into it can be uh, can sometimes be problematic. Ellie, do you have anything to add to that? Part of the conversation. Uh, yeah, um, I kind of get to cheat because um, as a Foley designer on predominantly new work, then that means mm -hmm. that that's kind of my in for uh, a lot of the feedback I might have for my writer colleagues. Also right. being a writer myself, so I'm not technically a co-writer on these opportunities, but I mm -hmm. still have a lot of my voice in the room. I'm sure that there was probably at least one session earlier today talking about writing in relation to earning the medium or earning the genre of audio drama. And I feel like as the Foley designer, that is a big part of my job. If I'm seeing an opportunity for something in uh, to inform the narrative in a soundscape, then I'm mm -hmm. going to lobby for that. Or if I think that uh, there is an instance of something that could be used better or more satisfactorily, then I'm gonna lobby for that. Um, there was a, a um, detective uh, noir pastiche we did a couple of years ago where mm -hmm. uh, the detective was always giving out his card to people. So is that sound, <laughs> that sharp sound of a, of a card being pulled out. And so the third time that he's meeting someone for the first time, he's actually yeah. being fished out of a lagoon because he was uh, following <laughs> the wrong lead. And so he says, yeah, my name's so-and-so, but he wasn't saying my cards. So I was like, hey, this is the third, this is the rule of three for my card, just instead of it being a sharp, it'll be a drip yeah. of it, like scorching out of the, like, because it's uh, soaked with water because we just fished him out. So yeah. things like that can be like fun uh, ways of building into the medium and make me feel like I'm a more valuable contributor. Or when we're doing that Star Wars parody that takes place on, in an entirely soda obsessed mm -hmm. universe and the bounty hunter gets encased in something but they don't really say what it's like well it's got to be a can a giant can of soda so that's when i'm lobbying for all these giant soda sound effects that can right. uh, add to the absurdity uh, absurdity of the situation because they, i think they said like oh, yeah we'll just stick them in carbonite and it's like no no carbonate so, <laughs> so i get yeah. those little opportunities to you know shoehorn oh. in my shameless <laughs> sense of humor but oh, I love, also, like, I... make it more sound uh, sound dependent. Um, there are other things too, where like there might be an instance where the exposition is a little bit too dialogue labored and we could be doing some of the same heavy lifting with the sound of uh, objects instead. Like don't, don't, you're going to knock over that basin and drop it could just as easily be no, no, you'll crashing sound effect. So little things like that can like, again, make your storytelling more efficient and mm -hmm. make the smartest person in the room. And this kitten is on their keyboard, I think. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure what's happening here. Yeah, I'm fascinated. Um, um, but I, so little things like that can be really fun for opportunities. Uh, I have also had those tricky relationship kind of things where, like, I have a dear friend and we're supposed to collaborate on a script, and we realize we do not write the same way at all. And so we step back a little bit and try to figure out a little bit more nuanced way of forgiving each other for our differences. And for as long as we're all doing this for the love of it, if there's not a deadline or a bottom line that we're meeting, the greatest resource and luxury we have is time. And that mm -hmm. is time to give each other grace in the room and figure out how to be the best collaborators we can be. I, I like that because very often when, when you're writing with other people, um, you know, there, there can be those kind of those kind of roadblocks, right? Because it's mm -hmm. just not gelling and to give each other space and just kind of go, you know, this is how we can kind of make this work with each other. And there's something here. And I think sometimes the the struggle is worth it, right? It, it, yeah. It's you can come up to some places where you maybe never thought you were going to get. Whereas if it was all just smooth, 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 sometimes it just kind of stays on that same plane but sometimes if there's a struggle or if there's i mean not a struggle with each other but just a struggle to kind of get the work done it can yeah. bloom into something new and exciting and and um just as an aside because i have to ask you this question um do you feel like as a fully artist you're a character in the audio drama or uh -huh. is is 
is that a thing for I you? am every character. I'm you're glad every, you're Okay, yes. fair answer, yes. To my, uh, and oh yeah, welcome to my TED talk, but as far as I'm <laughs> concerned, uh, I act as an extension of the characters that the voice actors are performing. I also act as uh, the, uh, the world they are inhabiting. And okay. from a sonic perspective, that means I am there to support their story. And from a performance perspective, that means that I am a, an extension physically and also a puppeteering element to the story that the audience is observing, uh, both through their eyes and ears. That's fabulous. What a great answer. I love that. Um, so one of the questions is also, um, when you're, if you've ever written for like myself, I've done team writing like with Lofar and with other people um, and a colleague of mine in the theater department that we worked together for years. Um, but I've never written like for a producer. I've never written, you know, for somebody else. Have you guys ever written for somebody else? And, and if so, how does that change your writing process? Ellie, have you, is that a, can you start yeah, on that? Um, it's tricky when you're entering a uh, pre-existing property, I'd mm -hmm. say, because you want to make sure that you are honoring the uh, integrity of the, the characters and the world uh, as it already exists. And if anything, you are yes anding rather than right. doing anything that's going to uh, interfere with canon unless it is something that you and the producing body have already uh, touched base on in some capacity. Um, I've uh, been a guest writer for Our Fair City. Um, a friend of mine and I collaborated on a live uh, production that was for the Chicago Fringe Fest. And okay. so Our Fair City is a very well-established universe already, because I think it was mm -hmm. five seasons in at that point. And okay. then with Locked in the Vacancy, um, they've got their Abbott and Costello analog are Clark and Belmont, which is one of the major intersections in Chicago as well, if you know okay. the city. And I don't, they have, no. yeah. uh, a couple of girlfriends who are Shantiz is uh, that they call Lake and Logan. Again, this is a, a gag where everyone, all the characters are named after uh, streets in Chicago land. Oh, that's uh, great. But I wrote a, because they were always doing like uh, stuff with werewolves or body, or body snatchers, people takers, or things like the supernatural kind of stuff. I wanted to do an episode focused on Lake and Logan where they uh, were in Narnia. And so, like, since we have the wacky supernatural adventures of Clark and Belmont, I wanted to do the uh, fantastical adventures of Lake and Logan. And so, like, I was kind of yes anding, but also trying to give the lady something to do. So I gotcha. Yeah. And and thank you for using the term yes and mm -hmm. as a as an improv teacher for the last thirty five years or so. You know, and and I don't know if if people who are listening uh, know the yes and philosophy. You know, but it's it's one of the things when teaching improv, you know, you always want to add to the story. You never want to block somebody. You never want to disagree with somebody. And so it's that yes and, and there's lots of games we used to play, yes and games, right? Just to get people ready. And, and I think that's a, that's a great thing to, to use. I think you hit on something with teamwork and writing rather than no, no, no. Okay, yes and. And then you're growing the you're growing the possibilities. Not that you're going to use everything, but if you use a, a yes and or make it a verb like you did, yes anding. I like that. You know, yes anding. Then what you're doing as a team is you're you're valuing what they've brought to the table, and then you're adding what you're bringing to the table. And I think there now you're kind of building something rather than I don't like that. Let's not and and rather than taking somebody's idea and just going no and they're sitting there going you know why aren't my ideas even you know thought of right mm -hmm. yes and and then make it grow so I, I thank you for bringing that up because I I hadn't thought of that in terms of writing and teamwork so nice thank you very much well, thank you I'd also like to pull it back Please. to what Keith was saying earlier about the best script is a finished script because mm -hmm. once you get that story all the way written uh, that's also something that's really valuable if you're yes ending with your with your team is it can be six hours long and you just need 30 minutes but it's always so much easier to cut things than it is to start like trying to shoehorn more things into making sense if you feel like your story is thin so it's almost exactly. like you've got uh, a, a slab of marble and you 
carved out a statue and now you have to carve out an even smaller statue. Right. And, and if you're in the point, I know if you're in the point where your script is thin and you've got to pad it just to get to 30 minutes or something, you're in trouble Shows. right from the start. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, Keith, how about you? Have you ever written for like another producer or and yeah. if so, how does that work for you and your process? For me, it's, you know, if they're paying or even asking or hoping, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's finding out what they want. What do you want out of this script? Some have come to me with very specific stuff. They've basically got their story written and they just want you to put, put it to words, I suppose, is, is one way to put yeah. it. Um, others have said, can you do a kid's play for me? Um, mm -hmm. And that's it. And uh, the secret is just knowing what they want um and and not being afraid to call them or email them and say you know what now um or i can go this way i can go that way what would you like um if you've worked with someone a few times you can usually get a sense of all that stuff um right um and and there's there's obvious things you know if, if you're if you're doing a church you know if you're if you're doing a church dinner theater there's certain topics you don't go down, you, you know, there's certain roads you're not going to want to take for the, you know, 80 year old ladies making the egg salad sandwiches, you know? Um, so there's a lot of discretion you have to use yourself. Um, and, and I've seen people try to be, try to step out of the norm and oftentimes that, uh, that doesn't work in their favor. So it's really about cultivating a, a strong relationship, but for brand new people, it's, you might have to ask them to the point that they're sort of blue in the face with you because they just, uh, we, we went over this. I told you that, whatever, but uh, yeah, it's finding out what they want and what you can provide. And ultimately at the end of the day, um, you have to not be afraid to say, no, this isn't me, but person X might put this together a little better. Um, That's a good point. You know, it's like, yeah, this isn't, it's not working for me, but yeah, you know, Lothard could do that. A really good job on that, you know, or something like that. I think that's, that's good. Yeah. Artists in general, I find are, are at all levels, sometimes scared to say no, because this one project could be the one, but oftentimes you learn very early when you're <laughs> over your head or when it's just not what you should be doing. And that's um, a, a really good point, Keith. And it's also it tricky. Um, I'm sure, Jeff, that you recognize this as a theater educator, like one of the things that we're indoctrinated into very early on is our own expendability and how we have mm -hmm. to say yes to everything. And yes. it's not until, you know, you get old and jaded like me that you start learning how to say no to things. But um, one of the great things that you can do for any team that you're in or even just community that you're in is uh, learn how to delegate. Um, yes. Never be afraid to ask questions. Um, because the goal is to make sure everyone's happy with the uh, with the output, and also to give uh, if it's not delegating to give outright referrals. So I really like what Keith has given us here. Uh, I do too, and I, and I think it's important. You know what I'm gleaning from what you're both saying. I'll get to you in a second, Luther. Um, you know what? It's falling asleep saying, up here. Uh, I know. I know. <laughs> uh, you know about saying no if it, if this just doesn't work for me, and and but the delegating part is so important because. It's so important to just like, especially if, if you're, you know, I was a director for many, many years and I still am, I guess, but, but um, you know, to, I learned early on that I was mostly a director of, of straight plays, dramatic plays, but I'd get hired or in school, they'd want me to do a musical, which wasn't my thing. I was in a lot of musical theater, but as a director, it was just, it was something that I didn't really enjoy. So I just made sure that I hired the best possible staff I could, who was going to tell me, who was going to be honest with me and not be, oh, yes, Jeff, yes, that's, it was going to be, no, that's a crappy idea. And I'd say, no, you do it better than me, go do it. And I, I would end up being like, more like a producer. Um, and I'd let them go, and, you know, and uh, because to know that, you know, I need help with this, or I, I, I can't really pull this off myself, I need help with it. I think, and I think that's, that's an important, yet mature thing to come to, because you're right, Ellie, you know, we all start out in this business and it's like, I got to get a job, you know, okay, I'll take that, I'll take that. And, you know, you, I've, I'm, I don't know if you have, but I've been in some really bad plays, you know, but I took the job, right, because I needed the job. And, but then later on, when you can start to say, 
uh, no thanks. You know, no thanks. That's a nice feeling. You know, it's like, that's not for me. That's not the, uh, you know, so let's let so-and-so do that. And you know. some of that does just come from life experience. Like yeah. I, uh, very early on, my uh, policy was I, I'm not allowed to say no to something simply because I think I'll be bad at it. Um, Me too. If I think I'll be bad on, at it and be miserable the whole time, that's a different conversation. Right. Yeah. Yes, that is a totally different conversation. I, because I was and mostly I have, a, a, yeah. And I had a decade where person. I was just taking anything that was thrown at me, and I'm a lot yeah. more discerning now because because I fell into Foley performance and that's what I artistically chose to dedicate my, my time to. And I've been asked to audition for traditional work in the interim. And I'm always just like, I can't risk taking the time away from this thing that I love. Right. And if you had told me I would feel that way when I was 12, when I was on stage for the first time, I would have looked at you like you'd grown a third head. But, sure. You know, yeah, but it's what life experience gives you. You start learning what it is that you're really passionate about and the you get more nuance. And and also it's about trying new things. And I think it's with writing too. And and because like I said, I was mostly a, an actor in straight plays. Um, but for some reason I was offered to lead the musical out of the blue. And I was like, I don't know if I can take this. But I did it and I got good reviews and I liked it. And so I ended up doing musical theater for like the next 10 years. You know, and, and kind of who knows where this whole path's going to lead. You know, if you just say yes, and then let's give it a shot. If it sounds like you're not going to be miserable, I'm with you 100%. All right, so Lothar doesn't fall asleep on us over there. He's <laughs> <laughs> doing musicals. What are you talking about? It's not this radio what, drama. What um, was the question again? Yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> Something about musicals. Um, no, anyway, no. No, um, um, so I, actually, right, I wanted to address right, something right, back when right, Keith was talking about uh, not being able to write well with someone. That mm -hmm. has happened to me in the past, and the way we worked through it was to basically say, these are the characters that I can have a good voice for. Those are the characters that you can have a good voice for. Let's keep it separate. We'll work together when we have them inter interlap. And this ties into the next part of your question of, have you ever written for another production company? Not really. I did mixing for the first year that I was sort of being trained to be a mixer. Mm -hmm. And um, because of the production process, uh, we split up our scenes to where one director, we called it directors, mixers, whatever, worked on these sets of characters and these scenes. And I would do the other. And that way we could have our own voice without it being too jarring of us working on the same scenes together, the same characters. And then there was one script writer that kept the voice from the script together and it made it work really well together that way. Um, the that only time sense. I've worked with someone <clears throat> for a production that was theirs was Mark Slade, where we did Daniel Dread together and he brought me in. He had the original idea. We were, he was going to do it in a certain way. And at one time we got on the phone and he was very gracious of letting me throw my ideas in. And it turned into something completely different from what his original thing was. He was very happy. I was very happy. It was a lot of fun, but it took him being able to say, here's my idea. I had it really strong. Let's throw all that out and do something completely different because I want to play with you. And that ties a little bit into um, writing for actors where, for example, when I did the Degasian, I wrote characters specifically for you and Jack. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I wanted you playing it. I was gearing it towards you. That's also the real seed behind the sort of the Crimson Tatters, even though I can talk about all the highfalutin stuff I want to do with genre and theme and bring in spiritual stuff and everything. Really, the initial thing was I wanted to write a show where Bill Holwig and I could be buddies together in like a buddy cop thing, but it was a fantasy. That was the initial seed of, I just wanted to invite my friend over and play with my toys in the sandbox with my buddy. How am I gonna make this happen and make it something that other people wanna hear? And that was a fun way of doing it too. Nice. And it, that is, isn't that great? And I, I yeah. and you know, if you knew Bill too, I, he always would tell me things like, well, I'm not a lead actor. I'm just a red shirt. I, I just, you know, I do a line here and it's so not true. Um, and I have to say that, that and Lothar is going to be mad at me for saying this, but, <laughs> but Crimson, Crimson Tatters is still one of the best things I've ever heard in my whole life. Thank you. And if you've never, I mean, uh, at the bottom of my heart, I, I think I, we hardly knew each other back then. Yeah. You know, and I was writing to you saying, this is the most amazing thing, you know, and, and uh, for so many reasons, which I won't give away any spoilers, uh, but I encourage everyone to go and listen to Lothar's Crimson Tatters and not only just because Bill Holway is great in it, but Lothar and, and uh, 
the gang and the soundscape is so beautiful and the story is great and and um I get he to kill kind of, Jack Ward in the first episode. Spoiler alert. Yeah, so that that's really why I liked it so much. But um, but I, I like the way that in talking about writing and, and the way you kind of turned, the one thing I think I told you back then was the way you kind of took that fantasy genre, but you flipped it. You know what I mean? You it didn't you didn't write with the tropes, you you flipped the tropes a lot and, and it was exciting in that way because because once you know once something happens that you know, it's like when Harrison Ford wanted George Lucas to have to have Han Solo die in the second movie, right? He goes, because if I die, then people will say anything can happen now. You know, and George Lucas is like, no, I don't think so. But, you know, when things like that happen, you're like, well, this is wide open. So I think that's that's fantastic. So the next question is, is um, do you write for a specific end? In other words, um, are you writing, like when you think of writing, are you writing... <laughs> A one-off? Are you writing a series? Are you writing something that's going to go on for five years? Do you know that? Does it? Does that take its a life of its own as you, as you start it out? Um, both. I want you to start with that one. Um, I usually write with the mindset of like a feature film, so I want mm -hmm. my story to be anywhere from an hour and a half to three hours long, split up into chunks. So I'll break them into 20 to 30 minute chunks. I'll try and make sure that those scene, there will be scenes that will end that will allow for the episodic aspect. But really I'm in, in my mind and the way I write it is like a feature movie. So I kind of do have an ending because I also realize doing ongoing series is really long, especially when you have a day job and other projects and there's no right. way I'm gonna be able to hit the weekly, monthly, whatever, ongoing thing for 40, 50, 175 episodes or whatever. So doing things as more, feature length stuff is is the right length for me. And then if I want to do a sequel, I could do that. But if I never get around to it, everybody has an ending. And it's not like, oh, he just pod faded. Like, you know, right. which we see all the time. And we've all done to varying degrees. Is that- So when, when you did the one story arc for, for Tatters, right? You could have gone on and done, I think you had planned I, I actually to had, do yeah, a I second had a, arc. I had a plan to do at least three or four more, but once Bill yeah. died, there was no way I was going to recast. I'm actually exactly. going to do that as prose. I'm going to do that as a prose thing. Yeah. Yeah. A, right. You're going to write that as a prose thing. So, so, uh, this, Ellie, do you have something to add to that? Um, I have a lot of the same attitudes, but, uh, the outcome is different. I'm a okay. big genre junkie and I oh, also nice. love me some anthologies. And so I uh, gravitate pretty naturally towards uh, 10 to 20 minute shorts. And okay. more often than not, I'm not nearly as altruistic as Keith is. Like most of the time when I get an idea to write something, it'll just be like one, one thought, one line or uh, a sound sequence that I want an excuse to get to do. And so I'll write a play around it. Um, there, I did a piece called Sour Toe Shuffle, which was about the, um, the, the, um, there's a bar up in the Yukon that has a toe in the in the bar and their signature cocktail features the toe. And so it was in the news like three years ago because someone had stolen the toe. And the, there was just like an interview with the barkeep who was really upset, understandably. He's like, that was a really good toe. And I just thought that was such a ridiculous <laughs> thing to say. And that turned in, in my head into that toe's been in our family for generations. And all <laughs> to write this. I want I want to make this happen. Um, so that was a one-off. And then with things like Lake and Logan, um, that was me having a relationship with these characters for a couple of years as their mm -hmm. uh, sound artist and being curious about where I could take them. And so I feel like um, it's a real credit to the company that I was working with that they were yeah. like, try it, let's, let's find out. So that's really gratifying. It, now you intimated this, so I just want to expand because I'm curious, as someone who's so keyed into sound, does, and you kind of said it, but does sound or a piece of music or something sonic, does that sometimes give you an inspiration to write something? I mean, you just, I, you just kind of said it, but I, I kind of wanted you to just maybe open yeah. that up a little bit. Cause I don't think that comes up a lot. 
Oh, 100%. Um, when I, we had a director for a couple of uh, years with Describe and she uh, groused one time that she didn't understand why people never did any sort of like witch's concoction because she thought that would go, uh, be a good sound combination. And so that was something else uh -huh. that I pulled into the, the bar uh, piece that I wrote was going through the steps, the labored steps of fulfilling the ingredients for this cocktail. Uh, because that was also a great way of staging and introducing the audience to the um, the uh, the rules of engagement or the, the mm -hmm. sense of play for listening to an audio drama because you would say, you know, uh, three squirts of Worcestershire sauce and then I'd go and yeah. then <laughs> to Tabasco and we'd have the person that could do the water drop do the water drop mm -hmm. and uh, things like that. And then when there's a another cocktail made later in the piece, they've been taught the recipe already by the, the matriarch of the bar who's so proud of herself. So then she can just shortchange it into a couple of those canonized sounds that people recognize already. And they'll, rec and they'll also recognize when the cocktail has been finished uh, being prepared. So it's teaching the audience how to listen to things. Uh, then other Perfect. things like that, like I have a Pinterest page that is all just dedicated to fun noise or sound trivia. When I learned that there was some spider in South America whose uh, thread is thick enough that you can hear it being broken. Oh, I hope that piece gets produced someday because it's so <laughs> fun. That's fabulous. Keith, how about you? Do you write for a specific end? You know, um, going uh, well, Yeah. Um... <sighs> In regards to the audio drama itself, this is still really a new thing for me. It's only been a couple mm -hmm. of years of sort of producing my own, and and a lot of the learning for me has just been the tech side. Um, yeah. So uh, I know one of the adaptations I did, I wrote it in this particular way that I would be using a ridiculous amount of sound effects and soundscapes so I could learn that. Um, but typically, no, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to sort of writing something fresh, um, for a very long time, it was something I could do. And I, it was always theater based. Um, how can I get this done? How can, who, who, who can play this role? Who can do that role? Where can I find this person? Um, which was very limiting, um, audio drama has opened that door. So there's not the limits that there was in that sense. Um, certainly it's, it's in a very inclusive, um, very inclusive and very uh, open medium. Um, but as far as right now, it's sort of a catch all for me with regard to audio drama, what works, you know, we've got a true crime thing going on. We've got a, a, uh, it's actually a historical reenactment of the Lizzie Borden trial. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, That's yeah. My, my neck of the woods. It sure is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. But then there's a local uh, series we're doing. I haven't done a series that's ever been in production before, but it's 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 goofy and just it's sort of a catch all right now. I'm really trying to find my way and find our group's way. No, that's that sounds great. It, and and so. You talk about the difficulty sometimes finding finding actors and how audio drama has opened that up for you. Do you ever find yourself writing for specific people? Sort of, yeah. Um, in the early, early, early days of like 18 months ago, um, <laughs> uh, it was very much like, um, you know, we were we were for our initiative because it was COVID because everyone was new, we were using cell phones and we were using tablets. And honestly, at the very beginning, it was who's going to get this to me and not flake out. Who's going to be right. good. And who's going to be, who's going to have half decent audio. And that really boiled down to about four people, um, frankly. Um, and then uh, that number has grown as people have said, Oh, this is really fun. Let me invest in a, in, in a snowball or a Yeti or, um, or, you know, let me even put a towel under my phone or, you know, I can't record this at the bus station. So now, um, now the, the, the circle has, has gotten larger. Um, so now it's sort of like, yeah, um, I, I can write this role for this person. Um, yeah, I'm finding that's, that's a big thing, uh, now, but not as big as it was, uh, you know, a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it's funny because I don't I don't necessarily find myself writing for a specific person because I, everything for me is just like organic now. It's writing, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. But as I start to develop characters, I go, okay, oh, there's Lothar, mm -hmm. there's Jack, there's yeah. Tanya, you know, there's, you know, just, just off co, you know, and, and so it's, it's like, you know, like they just kind of come and, and I think that, you know, that writing for specific people, I mean, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty common thought that, you know, Shakespeare did it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, Will Kemp, he, you know, he's writing for Will Kemp to be the fool or the clown, right? So Will Kemp was always the fool or the clown, so he left the, 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 uh, the players, you know, and, and so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an age old thing of, of writing for certain people and, and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of people do it and a lot of people um, certainly don't. Now, um, on the flip side now, like currently, you know, we, we've talked a lot and uh, with the world opening up again, people just simply do not have 12 hours to record something. Um, and on top of that, you know, we want it to be more inclusive um, right. and, and, to be perfectly frank, our, 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 our core group and our slightly extended core group is a very specific group of demographics. Um, so projects are being looked at and developed now um, and written that will allow more inclusiveness. Um, almost by being like, you know, here's the character and, and, and my job as the writer producer is to stop thinking this is for Bob. This is for Bill. This is for okay. Susie. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm finding that's uh, that transition, not so bad, to be honest with you. Um, it's just, let's write a good character and uh, we're going to open these up to the world and see who wants to partake. I think that's a great point. And yeah. I actually about, we had a Jack and Lothar and I at mutual audio you know, I think we, we talked about, you know, finding new voice actors to bring in new, fresh voices. And um, I went on, I went on Twitter and I just posted a bunch of stuff on Twitter and I just started listening to people's because a lot of people have their voice demos up on Twitter mm -hmm. and listening to voice demos and just inviting people. Hey, why don't you come? Because, you know, I, I would be up front. This is unpaid. Nobody makes any money here. You know, none of us do. Um, you know, so you, you have to know that up front. I wish I could pay you, but I can't. Um, but if you want, you know, you're going to get it. If we're going to do it, it's going to go on mutual. So it's going to go everywhere on every, you know, pod, you know, case thing, Spotify, every place. It's going to be out there. Um, you can use it in your reel if you want to. And, um, but I was able to go out and I was able to, to find a whole lot of people who wanted to be a part of it. And I was specifically looking for as we talked about earlier, Ellie, um, people whose voices are not normally heard in the mainstream. So uh -huh. transgender actors and, and LGBTQ actors, and people of color. And, and um, so, and really there was a lot of them and we were able to bring a lot of people in. And uh, uh, we did a thing for Mutual, a story circle theater where people read um, public domain, like children's stories. Mm -hmm. to promote family listening and to promote reading and people just jumped on that and there's one woman I don't know if she's here today I, I love her so much Sharon Grunwald and she's so amazing and I think she's she's working her way through the entire Brothers Grimm canon she's done about 20 of them <laughs> for Story Circle Theater and she's so good and her husband wrote the theme for it and so it became this thing and and, you know, I never would have found her if we didn't do this outreach to go and try to find people and invite them in. You know, we invite you to come join us. You know, it's not, you, you know, you don't have to audition. It's just come on and do this. And, um, and so many people have done it. I'm so grateful. And I, I wonder if any of you have done anything similar to that to, uh, you know, just try to find new people and especially voices that are typically underserved in this community we've had uh we've had uh one area is we've had we've got a few actors who who don't perform anymore due to stage fright um mm -hmm. or or uh other uh, uh 
mental psychological issues. Um, mm-hmm. Even myself, I don't perform much anymore because my knee is is destroyed. So I have a bad mm-hmm. knee. I can't uh, can't do it. We have a one one young guy who uh, has one, well, he's not that young. He's a couple of years younger than me, but he's wanted to perform for years. Um, but he's blind um, and mm-hmm. has always been too scared. And he played a cop running through a field and had the greatest time of his life. Not the greatest time of his life. That's really tooting my own horn, but he had a fantastic time doing it and he'll be back again. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, our plan is to really expand and, uh, and, and get more folks who, yeah, have not been, who, who don't get the opportunity necessarily. Um and, and, you know, I mean, for years we have been doing, you know, the world has been doing colorblind casting, um, and, and what they, what they used to call colorblind casting. And there are some audience members that really can't get over that. It's that's their problem, not the productions, you know, right, exactly. however, yes. however, on rate on, on audio in audio, 90% of the time, they don't know who's who. Um, right. I used to joke that our actors were all nude when they were performing. Um, who knew, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um so it's just uh, in the audio realm the the doors are way open for us with less uh with less uh i guess ignorant audience members picking at it um other than of course regular internet trolls which are yeah. they're just fun anyway so <laughs> they're always around yeah oh how about you Do anything to add to that piece um i i would uh just do a quick shout out to the folks at Hard Life, Hard Life NFP because I feel like the the casting and story creation that they've been curating for the past several years have uh, been dedicated to equity, inclusivity, inclusivity, diversity, and belonging in a way that nice. is really one of the the front runners in the Chicago artistic scene. And I'm really proud to be affiliated with them. And mm. I want more of the companies that we have in in Chicago and beyond to learn from their example. Um, uh, in keeping with the the issue, the double-edged sword of, you know, we we wanted to do, get to work together and so we formed a company together and now right. we don't represent the, the city in a responsible and ethical way. Like one of the companies that I belong to was on the verge of uh, auditioning new talent when the COVIDs happened and uh, I have to understand also that a lot of companies have not been active during this time, some of them because they could not sustain themselves and some because they uh, were learning other lessons, which is challenging. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of t- uh, ways that we as artists can and should have been using this time. And we're going to see who did the work uh, right. as the aftertimes start rolling out what we're doing, who we are, and why we're doing it this way. I, I think that's great. I, I remember just real quickly, um, I was directing The Crucible a number of years ago, and I had a woman come in to audition who was in a wheelchair, and, and she was quadriplegic. And uh, I cast her as one, of the, as one of the Salem girls. And I remember someone saying, how are you gonna put somebody in a wheelchair on stage and not have it you know, take people out of the show? I said, they won't believe me. It didn't, you know, no one noticed the, it, you, you know what I mean? It was just, she yeah. was part of the show. She was one of the Salem girls crying out and doing, you know, that. And, and, um, and I was always, you know, I was always very glad I, I took that chance. This is a long time ago. And, and I learned a good lesson from it, you know, about inclusive, you know, everybody deserves to get on that stage and no matter what, and, and uh, everybody deserves a chance. And my cat's here to visit. So, you know, she's no she is complete without a kitty i know and exactly yes. and she'll be a pain in the neck though because she's she wants to get on my lap and not now uh lothar anything to add to that conversation yeah i i really like one of the things i really love about audio dramas it's somewhere between the um purposeful ambiguity of theater stage theater where you can easily ignore that someone is in a wheelchair if you just allow yourself to go along with that suspension of disbelief. Film is far more photorealistic. It's harder to, you know, the the expectations of film can be a little bit more literal. Audio drama is a little between the two and you can sort of lean into each way that it is. A lot of times when I write, I specifically don't even want to describe the way the characters look to me at all. Sometimes I won't even 
see them in my head or if I do it's more of a, a vague thing I don't want to say that this person is six foot one with blonde hair and they're of Taiwanese and German extraction unless there's a reason for that in the story I would rather it be open so that each person can maybe project what they see into it the same way with a novel sometimes there's certain people where they want to describe the characters and sometimes they want to leave it open so that each person can project their own import into that story and I think that then ties into what is going on with the political aspects, the socio-political aspects of bringing more people in because it opens that up. If I don't feel that I can write a story from the LGBTQ voice and it would be artificial and I don't feel comfortable doing that, right. I can still cast anybody in any role that I want because it's just about their voice and their talent. If they want right. to tell a story, if they want to work with me on that, I can help bring that in. But anything, it just, it opens it up. It doesn't close things down. So I like that aspect to it. Fantastic. I Do you know, Lothar, if we have any questions in the queue? Yes. Uh, there was one that uh, I kind of addressed a little bit. Naomi H. put something in the Q&A way back at the beginning. When co-writing a script, how do you handle the logistics of trading off between writers? I kind of talked my little process of that, but what about you guys? Yeah. Anybody have any thoughts on that? When, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ellie. Go ahead, Keith. Yeah, go ahead. I, when I, I, when I, I faked I, out. <laughs> <laughs> When I've had to do it or when, when it's worked on some level, it's very much, uh, um, I do this and then I'll hand it off to you and you do what you want with it and, or vice versa. Um, I, I've, I've had no success, I suppose, face to face, you know, sitting down, what are we going to write now, buddy? But when it has worked, it's been almost like, uh, I'll do draft one, you do draft two. Um, I think in some ways that's how the Pythons wound up doing it in the end. And that was oh, really, I think so. I could be wrong. Certainly Gilbert and Sullivan, they didn't even speak to one another. So they were, right, sliding, right. They they were sliding papers yeah, under the yeah. door to one another. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. And, and uh, it's not something I've done enough of really to, to have much, much more to, to say, but I, I saw the question early on and I've kind of been wondering, you know, how, how do people do it? I think for me, it's, it's a, I haven't done it a ton. I've mostly done it, you know, with Lothar and, and a couple other people to an extent, but there's so many different ways to do it. And it's just, it de depends. It depends on the dynamic between the people and Lothar and I are, are friends yeah. and we can be honest with each other. And, and it's just, um, you know, we, we did like, I think Lothar, you said it this morning, like when we're writing the spy thing and I made up the main character that I, liked and you made up the main character that you liked and then we kind of gave them some attributes and then we wrote the scene to give each other the flavor you talked about that this morning and then we exchanged those scenes so you had an idea where I was coming from with my character and I had an idea where you were coming from and that's we have you know that's been kind of stagnant for a while but I, I want to get back to that because it's such a cool idea um you know but that was one way and then the other way we you know we started with the exquisite corpse where you write some and I write some and and then, you know, you, I write some and you write some in and we build it that way. And, and uh, I think there's just a million different ways to do it. And it all depends on how you are with that other person or those other persons. And, but I think, I think the key is just to open up communication and just say, hey, let's set some ground rules here. Let's be honest or whatever, you know, put some boundaries in there and say, you know, um, so that you're not hurting someone's feelings or you're not stepping on somebody's great idea. Because, you know, um, I, you know, I'm sure that you all worked with directors when I was, you know, acting a lot and assistant director. And there were some directors who were just so gruff or theater teachers, like some old time theater teachers who were just like gruff and it was just, like, ah, it sucks. You know what I mean? And and I think that you, you may or may not, you probably will agree with me, but once you, you give someone, it's a, in a creative situation, once you shoot someone down like that, you just shut, they just shut down. It's like, yeah. I'm never gonna take a risk with you again because of what you just did to me. You know, and if you don't have that kind of kindness and, uh, you know, I always tried to teach theater with acting with kindness and, and just love and a lot of Zen and breathing and just, you know, what do we have? and, and and um, so I think in any creative situation, if you're with somebody who's toxic like that, 
who's just going to shut you down or get angry and say, no, nah, that, you know, that's a terrible idea. Then it's probably better off just to say, you know, I think this is probably not a good idea and do like we talked about before Ellie, right. And say, I think I'm just going to step out of this. Yeah. Right? So, um, yeah. That, yeah. If I can that tell up a really, oh, just, it brings up a really good point about professionalism. Uh, we work in a, volunteer amateur world a lot of us at least in regards yes. to our audio drama we all have day jobs and some of the best advice i got as an oral storyteller early on is even though you're not getting paid does not mean you don't have to be professional i agree and i think one of the things when you're writing with other people and it turns into a complete horror show you do your best you get through it you say thank you very much. You stop working with that person, but you don't throw them under the bus. You don't go on a Facebook rant. You don't get in their face. You just say, we're going to finish this up. We're going to all do the best we can. And you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. Maybe we'll work in a different way, or maybe I don't want to work with you at all, but that doesn't right. mean that I'm going to be a jerk about it. I'm just going to say, thank you. No, thank you. And move on. Good point. Thank you. Ellie, you wanted to say something. I could see it. Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, just in keeping with um, with transparency and constructive care, uh, I'll tell a personal anecdote real quick. Um, I had uh, someone reach out to me and say, hey, do you want to write something with me? And I didn't have any reason to think I would enjoy this. So mm -hmm. I just said, well, um, I don't know a lot about your voice as a writer. Uh, I would love to read something that you've written, and then maybe we can talk about it. And he said, yeah, I'll send you one of my old plays. And a week later, I hadn't gotten anything. And so I texted, hey, you were going to send me some of your old work. Don't make me chase you. And he said, yeah, yeah. sorry, I'll just get that. Uh, I got ahead of myself. I wanted to edit it so it was the best possible for you to see. Uh, I'll get that right to you. Never heard from him again. No complaints. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I know, you know, it's, it's those kind of things of, 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 um, it's, they're easy to say, and, and, you know, when I was teaching film years and years ago, I had a boss that would come in and say, oh, we want to make this film that is this and this and this and this and this, you know, which means that, you know, I was going to do it, you know, and then, so I was like, finally, I come up with a thing and I said, oh, that's a great idea. So here's a, here's a story pitch idea. Here's some storyboard paper, right? So draw some storyboards. Here's this. And I gave them, you know, a stack of paper about this thick and they just mm -hmm. stand there and go, I said, yeah, get those back to me next week. Never once in all the years I did it, did anyone ever bring it back? And I never yeah. had to do those projects, you know, from the idea men or the idea, you know, people, you know, and, and same, same type of thing, you know, and staying away from kind of, you know, it, it comes back to the saying no. And I think mm -hmm. that's a good takeaway from this session of, of it, if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. You yeah, know, and we, and, we have another, and, small, we have another question. Like, if you want to just try oh, a good. 10 minute piece with someone, then that'll teach you a lot yes rather than committing to a full season or a, a full length of anything then no because if you didn't like working together on something small you're not going to like working together on something big oh no Lothar, what's the next question so, uh bob arnold has the question oh, wow. excellent question given the possibility of disagreements is it important to agree ahead of time who has the final say on the script or is it better to approach a project as equal partners there's a pistol in the middle of the room. It's there for <laughs> I'll give the great answer of yes, depending on the situation. <laughs> there are definite times I think there should be someone who has executive say, if it comes down to that. But if if you're approaching this of a really, like Jeff and I are on the project we're working on, it really has to be both of us or else it's not gonna work. Yeah. With right. Mark Slade and doing Daniel Dredd, he had final say. If he really didn't want something I liked, it's like, hey, it was your buddy, it was your baby. Uh, I'm yeah. here to support you. I'll back yeah. off. So I think it's clear to just have clear communication and know what that is. But that's what works for me. I'm a Libra. So um, yeah, what do you guys think? I am too. I'm a Libra too. I, I think I'm just going to jump in real quick, and then I'll let you guys go because it's, it dovetails with what Lothar just said. That I think that that there have been a lot of times when when whatever I write, I always try to involve Lothar and Jack because I respect them and their opinion and their writing and everything. So. And they always give me great feedback and they they'll send me stuff like that. But in that case, it's something that I originated. And so I would have the final say of it, but they're always very generous in going, oh, well, this is what I do with this character or this, maybe try this or like that. And it was the same if, if Lothar ever sent something to me and said, hey, what do you think about this 
you know, I would love to just add my two cents, but I understand that some of it, none of it might get used, but, but I'm always willing to add that in. And I understand that, you know, that's it. But I think you need to set that boundary up, you know, rather than say, okay, you know, I'm going to have the final say, but please, please, please give me some feedback on this. So Keith, do you have something on that question? Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the number one, issue uh, firstly yes if possible someone needs to be the buck has to stop with someone um because right. compromise can kill a really good project uh if it's if it's not done properly um the issue well i i guess for me um i will lose less sleep over a fight over dialogue than i will over a flight a fight over plot um mm. If you have your skeletal structure, A, B, C, D, all the way down to the end, and that's agreed upon, you know, you'll, you'll accept an odd, bad joke. But if suddenly all your characters, you're told, okay, everyone's going to space now, and I'm not continuing with the project unless I can write a bit about going to space. Well, suddenly your, you know, your 18th century Jane Austen piece doesn't make sense anymore, you know. Um, because it's too awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll work together on something else. Yeah, let's do that. Let's, let's do it. Dana. That. Um, <laughs> I cannot figure out this camera. I apologize. What um, kinds of manner stuff in space here? Yeah, yeah cool. but uh, it's, I mean, you know, even with dealing, even when, when, when your actors are, are wanting to do something, I mean, I've, I've, I've let a bad joke into a production, like a, a silly joke or a silly bit of blocking to allow the actor to be more comfortable with the, big picture um a, a silly little business that really didn't get noticed and didn't get a laugh from me um so so yeah the, the buck has to stop somewhere whether it's another writer a producer whomever you, you need the final arbiter i think okay. ellie do you have something to add uh, well i'm an aries so i will fight you but uh, yes. uh, yeah, um, I'm seeing and uh, nodding along enthusiastically with uh, constructive care, transparency. I think it's important to say, look, uh, this is this doesn't work for me. And here are my concerns mm. if it comes to that point. But I'm a big fan also of making sure that you are uh, in agreement about the overarching the the story outline and then the nuts and bolts can be a little bit more negotiable. Uh, mm -hmm. with your characters and with your collaborators. I really like what Jeff was saying about like, if it's his project and he's like building a team, that is a very different dynamic than if we're like, you know, Wonder Twins Activate. Right. Um, yeah. And I also really like what Keith is saying about like, you know, you're not gonna fight every battle. Um, and one of right. the things that I like to point out that is, uh, can be great about um, ensemble curation of uh, stories is that when it comes to any artistic discipline, only mm -hmm. the top 10% of anything is actually any good, but that 10% is different to everyone. That's why we benefit from having oh. some voices in the room. So even if that bit didn't get a laugh from Keith, somebody in the audience may have la uh, noticed it and that could have been their favorite part of the show. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. But I think that's, wow, that's a great point. That 10% thing, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna be thinking about that. I, I didn't have to send you an email because that's that's Thank great. You. I love that. You know, I. I, I this has been such a wonderful day. I just, uh, I can't even tell you. Yeah, um, getting yeah. all these perspectives, right, Lothar? I mean, just listening to everybody and, and putting faces to names or, or you know, because I've listened to stuff that most everybody's done. And, and you know, I Bob Arnold just asked that great question. And like, during the dinner break, I listened to some of his stuff I'd never listened to before. And it's amazing. You know, and, and it's just, um, you know, it's just been such a wonderful time. So, what um, I actually have something to add to, uh, to what do. Ellie was saying, which was yeah. um, about that transparency and also communication where it's like, let's say that uh, the plot is going a certain way, kind of like Keith was saying, you know, it's always um, the plot's going in a certain way and we have a certain agreement as to what the show is doing. And maybe another writer wants to take it in some way that's going to compromise that. So we have to sort of say, well, okay, maybe part of it is why do you want to do this? What, what's so cool about it? how can we still include what your emotional passion is about this in a way that works for the plot? So instead of saying this plot point doesn't work, what is it that made you wanna make that plot point? What mm -hmm. made you wanna put the character through this? Can we come up to some way? Can we do the yes and 
but more of a, well, maybe I want to say yes, but let's really clarify so we can get to the yes and point. And we're yeah. going to have to have that crucial conversation to get to that point. I really like that, Lothar. It's, yeah. um, it's kind of like saying, you know, what problem are you trying to solve? Or what problem do you see and how does this solve it? Because yeah. maybe this is a problem that stems from further back that we have a different solution for or a different opportunity with. Right. And if you're open to that, you're open to that, if you have that open communication, because I know that I brought this up earlier, but when I had written, uh, I don't know, last year sometime, I had written the um, kind of an ethereal Western and I had the script done. I mean, I had like, I, then, I, then I had it done and then I sent it to Lothar and Jack and, and they sent me all kinds of ideas. And I realized that there was a whole rich subplot that I had never thought of until I think Lothar said it to me, something about, you know, you had brought in some kind of spiritual stuff and, and yeah. kind of educated me right on uh, all this, all this stuff. And I was like, Oh my God, this is so amazing that I had actually had it cast and I was ready to go. And then the stuff that you sent me, I was like, no, I need to fix this. So, you know, I, I, <laughs> I said all the I said to all the actors I said maybe fix isn't the right word but I need to make you know I I can make this better because of what you just told me, and you know I I send out all the actors I said okay guys we're gonna put this on hold and you may have a different part when this comes back around because now this has become like a multi part thing and now I've, I've, I'm changing it all around and I never would have done that if it wasn't for you so I thank you for that and and. Uh, I think it would have been okay if we had done it the way it was, but now I think maybe it'll be like really good. And um, so that, that I, I mean, just- a, That What's brings that? up a thing about consultants. Like we've been talking about co-writing with people, but sometimes some of the most fruitful uh, creativity I've had is where someone else just asks me because they know that uh, Lothar geeks out on, uh, you know, Northern European history and magical religious practices. Okay, mm -hmm. great. I can give ideas, they can shoot it down because it works or doesn't work. So working with consultants and there's times where I've had to like go to people and, and bring them in um, to give me the aspect of that. And then they get to be a part of it. They didn't write it for me, but I go like this scene would not have been, would not have had verisimilitude if I hadn't talked to someone who worked in that profession who could help me make it as good as possible. Everybody still gets to play, but we're not fighting our egos of who wrote what or the other. Uh -huh. So that's another important part of teamwork as well. I'm going to That's jump in real quick point. because with a uh, shout out to, um, I don't know if uh, any of you are familiar with the author, Mary Robinette Cole. Uh -huh, uh, yes. I have the biggest no. art crush on her, uh, but she's got a new Patreon feature that she's doing where she is interviewing uh, folks about their professions for deep dives for any time she's featuring one of those professions in one of her uh, novels. Cool. So oh, I would what totally a great idea. That out it sounds like it's uh, after your own heart. It that does. I mean, that's just, that's fantastic, you know, and, and just, it's such a gift, you know, Lothar and Jack have given me over the years of just reading my stuff and then saying, hey, try, you know, how about this? Or how about this? Or, and, and they don't care if I say no, or, you know, it's like, it's just, I'm just throwing it out there. But it's such a gift of time and, and, and reading something that you put your heart and soul into and then have somebody honor that and just say, this is wonderful here's another idea you might want to think about. And, and I think that's a great way to work. Um, you know, if, if, you know, well, you said like the Wonder Twins thing, right? You know, that's one way or the consultant is another way or just kind of, you do this, I do this, we come together and kind of make it into this. And, and um, you know, so I think that in this, this hour and a half, we, I hopefully for the people who have been listening and I know for me, um, I've learned so much and, and we've, I think we've kind of come up with lots of different strategies and lots of ways to, to team up and uh, get together and, and work because that that's what it's all about. It's community and especially if you work satellite like a lot of us do, it can be, it can be um, you know, restricting in terms of it can be very, very isolating because you're working by yourself. And so to be able to have people that you can work with and bring in new people and new voices and, and you know, honor people from every place that you can and, and tell new stories that aren't just, you know, you know, white European stories, right? You know what I mean? Nothing wrong with those, but you know what I'm getting at, right? You know, and, and, and um, you know, to bring those stories in and have that be told. And I, 
you know, I think, you know, it's, that's, that's the future of all this. It's just having everybody's voice be heard. So we're, we're getting close to time. So um, let's just end with, if you want to, we'll start with Keith. And if there's anything that you, that's left unsaid, I always, you know, when I teach graduate school, I say, what, what, what's left unsaid? What have you been dying to say for the last hour that if you don't say it, you're not going to, you know, you're going to go, damn, I wish I said that. And then we can add with, um, what you're working on now. So go ahead, Keith. Well, I, I think I just figured out my camera. It seems to be something to do with the light because if I put nice. my lighter near it, it turns on again. So I, I don't win. Know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, uh, ultimately, 100%, uh, it's got to be fun. Um, even if you're getting paid too often, we will say, well, I'm getting paid so I don't have, have to enjoy myself. That leads to uh, a very sad situation. Um love what you're doing and even if it's garbage embrace the garbage um uh, <laughs> there are shows from 25 years ago that were completely embarrassing uh at the time that i look back with nothing but smiles because we were all in it together and we were suffering together and, i mean we're not talking we're not talking old war buddy type thing but we still get together and talk about the the jokes we made about the script backstage um yeah love what you're doing reach out be involved not only should you invite people into your projects take time and work on someone else's um which is something i hope to do myself in the next few years hint hint producers our next few months <laughs> um <laughs> uh jack will hopefully speak nice about me publicly anyway um i'm sorry uh, working on well lion's den audio we are learning the tech we are still uh, the lizzie borden audio trial we are on youtube and uh, a couple of uh, podcasts we're doing uh, saturday night live we're going through every episode um uh all 900 of them <laughs> we're at 12 um uh and a few other things uh just uh if um yeah i see flight of the airmen there um I'm, yeah I'm, jack just popped that up there I think that was a hit for you, Keith. Anytime, Jack. Anytime. <laughs> but, um, just not this coming week. We're going on vacation. Our first vacation okay. in like six years. Our okay. first vacation since, uh, yeah, we, we have four children. And uh, our last vacation was three kids ago. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Lion's Den Audio is over on YouTube. We love to chit-chat with people. Um, I, I just like to talk to people. And I love to get there. I, we, I realize I'm new. So, uh, okay. you know. And my one thing for theater, film, art, anything is 50% of the work is casting it right. Um, yeah, more than that. Yeah, yeah, probably 90. But, uh, but if it's cast right, uh, people will, 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 will enjoy it. Um, thank you, Keith. Thank I, you. That, I didn't want to cut you off there. Ellie, how about you? Something just something you're just kind of laying there for you to add, and then what are you working on now? Uh, when it comes to um, how we uh, build better teams, uh, that means supporting each other as well. That means go see other people's stuff, especially yes. considering what we've been talking about. If you live in a city that has a Latinx theater company, go see yep. their stuff. Pay for those tickets. If you have an LGBTQI uh, theater company, go see their stuff. Pay for mm -hmm. those tickets. Then you have a program afterwards. You can see their names. You can contact them and see, say, hey, come read for my stuff because you're awesome. And you, I want you to help me make me more awesome. Uh, all that with a provisor of when it is safe to do so. Because yes, COVID course. is a thing. And it it's is. not gone it is. anywhere. Because <laughs> we're not treating it like it's a thing. <laughs> uh, what am I working on right now? Um, yeah. I am making my Edinburgh Fringe debut in August with the good uh, okay. folks at Quirky, Sarah Golding and Fiona Thrall. It's going to be yeah. the Z yeah. box because apparently I wished on a monkey's paw at some point. But oh, you did. Uh, yeah. come check us out and help us uh, pave the way for a demand for us to come in person in 2022 so I can also be with y'all in Canada in 2022, because yes. the year of adventure just got deferred by two. That's what I'm trying to convince myself of. I like it. Thank you so much, Ellie. Elothar, we'll end with you. Uh, first, I say congratulations about the Fringe Festival. My uh, stepdaughter yes. uh, did her master's work in, at the University of Edinburgh, and it's a wonderful town. 
She got oh. to go for two years to the to the fringe and we got to visit a few times. It's a wonderful city. Have a blast. It's awesome. Oh, um, it's just through this, my friend. It's just through this. Oh, 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 it's just, oh I'm it's sorry. Slow. Okay. Yeah. Never mind. Yeah, never, anyway. <laughs> never mind. Um, It'll still be there. Yes, yes, it will. Um, I, I'm, I'm working on uh, two shows right now uh, in post-production and doing a little recasting to fix one. One is uh, She-Wolves Prowl the Promised Land, which is a car exploitation oh. film or audio drama. And uh, um, the other one is going to be a transcontinental terror for uh, 2021. Since that's coming up, I better work on that. The last bit of advice I would say would mirror Keith's with... Um, make sure you have fun and one of the things for working for other with other people is sometimes working for them with a licensed property and we talked a little bit about that but one of the big things for me is i learned very early on that i do not want to write an existing character i've never had the dream to write for batman or wonder woman or james bond i'm not going to be the right person to do that so understand what you like to write what you're good at and what you enjoy, because if it's something you don't enjoy, it is really, it's harder work than you would ever imagine. It'd be easier to, you know, be on your feet all day as a cook, because I've done that too. Um, just right. know what you, what right. you like, what you do, and do it. Don't force yourself to do something you hate. And we'll end on that. I can't thank you all well enough. That was an amazing hour and a half, but I just, uh, I'm so pumped now. I uh, really thank you all, and, and I hope we do get to meet in person. I hope we all get to work a low times, but we'll keep going, but I hope keep, and Ellie, I hope sometime we can work together and do something that would be so much fun. And yep. um, everybody else, you know, out there, thank you for listening. And next up is revisions and quality control. And I'm gonna watch that because I need to know about that. Uh, it starts at 8.45 next up. So thank you all for listening. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome.